Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Fosters. Fosters, that's that's Australian for human factors, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, it is episode 132. Today is June 10th, 2019. You're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnstorf. Having a nice Fosters here. So many Fosters. Absolutely. Uh, Australian for Human Factors. Uh, we got some excellent news stories and uh, tackling, tackling some questions from the community. Uh, this week, we got what? We got the driver list. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. These are... Wait, nope, that's right. Driverless cars, once they're on the road, human drivers should be banned. I was thinking it was the last last week's news story. Because didn't we talk about autonomous vehicles last yeah, week, we too? Yeah, we did. We talk about it every week, don't we? Every single week here. A first look at Amazon's new delivery drone. And uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this, but and I'm sure it will be a joke. Uh, Jacko, I think, is a low-powered robot arm that hooks to your wheelchair. Um, but yeah, you can find us every... But first, some programming notes. You can find us every Monday... Tuesday, around noon Pacific. Well, it's a show, guys. You can find us on Monday, Tuesday, and uh, that's it. You know what? I think you can find us Mondays, too. You know, Jeff is out there repurposing some of our older shows and putting them up on YouTube. Right. So if you're, like, trying to get caught up, I think we have a set schedule there. I think it's, what, every Wednesday? Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday? I think that's the schedule. Yeah, check us it's out It's on one YouTube. of those times. It's one of those. So uh, that's YouTube.com slash Human Factors Cast. And uh, we're, we're keeping that slash name because you guys know the saga. Okay, Blake, I want to know what's going on with your world, though. Like, what's going on with you? Yep. So I'll bring it back last week in case anybody missed the show. I had just started leasing a new car, and it's got a bunch like a bunch of automated tools in it. Right. And we, it was, we went for a test drive. Yeah, we went for a test drive. Tried to get the lane. Lane detection doesn't work the way I thought it did. Okay. And it tr- actually, to follow up on us not getting to do that that much in the car when we were together... It turns off so much on its own. The lane detection. Yeah, because wow. I think the cameras get are really sensitive to what it can and can't see, so they kind of okay. like overcorrect for themselves. Like it's like, oh, I'm not really sure. I'm going to turn off. So I get that indication more than I get anything. So is it used for anything? Like, <laughs> um, not really that I found yet. Have you been stuck in traffic with it? No, okay. and I haven't. So why don't you just like head up the five right after this? And well, I actually just... have to now because I've moved. So I'll be going to the five oh, to go yeah, home. That's yeah, right. All right. So, so it'll be different today, probably. Yeah. Um, but I just it was nuts to me because I've become addicted, I think, to a couple of the features. And it's I don't know if it's making me if it if I went and got in my other car today, right. if I would have already picked up bad habits like checking my blind spot because I have like a really great blind spot indicator. So oh, every okay. time like a car is coming in the blind spot. I just trust the car and I've only had it for a week, been driving without one for like, you know, however many decades. And now, now I just trust the car right away. You trust it. Like, because you haven't run into a situation yet where it's been wrong. Exactly. Yeah. And that first day where you're, you start to merge in one direction and then you hear a horn lay down, you know, yeah, that's, that's going to be a rude awakening. It is definitely, but it's kind of nuts to like that fast. You could, I don't know for me, at least that fast, like feel like, very confident in what the car is telling me it's kind of insane right i mean does it have any prevention so if you like like take the lane or the blind spot indicators does it have any prevention if you were to start turning in that direction like i doubt it it might it might it might freak out a little bit right oh just like just flash or something yeah it would decide like don't don't, don't, don't." huh yeah it might like give you another indication like oh no i don't think you want to do that but it probably won't stop me from doing anything okay what other what other types of features are you looking at that like if you were to hop in your old vehicle? Oh, the backup camera is insane. Okay, it makes parallel parking and backing into anything like almost like a game. Okay, so I have a <laughs> I have a fun story about backup cameras. So uh, my partner and I were walking. I think we were going to see a movie or something, and we were walking in a parking lot. And we were walking behind cars, and all of a sudden, this car like comes out and almost hits us, backing up, and. We're like, what the fuck? And we went up to this guy and we're like, what the fuck? You almost hit us. Like, that is not cool. What is going on? Pay the pay attention yeah. like, to the road. We were very upset. Uh, and he's like, sorry, I don't have a backup camera. Like, turn around. <laughs> turn around. <laughs> do the thing you're supposed to do. <laughs> turn around. I don't care if you have a backup camera. I don't care how privileged you are with your car. Turn around and look for people. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. I think you do. have to like 
you know, take a driving test, and that's something you're yeah. supposed to be able to do. It, it pissed me off a lot. <laughs> Which is funny about my backup camera, right? Because it's got some, I don't know what the setting's called, but it's always on that if it catches some detection behind you, it's going to jerk the right. emergency brakes can immediately. You, can you turn that off? or You I, can, I, which I don't know why people would. Right. But it, I always see the indicator that it's on, because I remember the guy, when I was at the dealership, he showed me with like a cone, something very small. Oh, okay. To indicate like if it was a child, it would stop. They which didn't is put, super jarring, by the way. He didn't have like a dog or something with him that he just threw it did, out? No. Like, okay. Thank goodness. That would have freaked me out even more. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, it's kind of hard for me even to think about like what it, why what it would be like to drive without some of these tools now until I've been like a week. Yeah, it, it, every, all of this like introduction of all this stuff because I used to say like I don't really need that shit in a car. What's the point? I don't. I already know how to drive. I'm yeah. pretty good at driving. Why do I need all these extra kind of bells and whistles? Um, but now it's it's so much fun to drive mainly because I have air conditioning and. A stereo right. unit that works. Well, I get okay, okay. So I get into like an accident annually. Not my fault. Um, ever. I'm serious. It's just it just happens with the sheer amount of time that I spend in a vehicle. It's almost yeah, you you almost spend, annually. Yeah, yeah. It makes Al- a lot of sense. Almost annually around the same time. I think I'm due for one. Um, so fingers crossed. But um, every year I get into an accident pretty much, and every time I have to take a rental car, I'm like, no cruise control. What the hell? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Driving 120 miles a day, like, I need cruise control. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so, so, like, even just that basic function um, is something that I sorely miss. And so I can't even imagine, like, uh, now you have your, your privilege vehicle. You got, like, all these bells and whistles that, like, you're rolling around in. I can't even imagine what it'd be like to be without those. Oh, it's so nuts. Hmm, just spoiled be. for choice. Yeah. Yeah. So spoiled. Definitely, for sure. So What's been going on with you, Nick? So, uh, you know, it's amazing what some small things can do to not only your self-esteem, but the way you think about yourself. Absolutely. Um, so this weekend, this weekend I got a haircut. Uh, and if you're watching the YouTube stream, hello, I got a haircut. Uh, and it's, um, so I usually go in and say, you know, like a three on the sides and about an inch and a half on top. Mm-hmm. I got lazy this time and said, just cut it short. Just get rid of it. Just cut it short. And she's like, all right, not even no clarification or anything. And uh, just kind of buzzed it for me. And I, you know, I I came back home and I was like, this is a little bit shorter than I wanted. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I Justine was surprised and, and I kind of like. The way I feel about this haircut, Blake, <laughs> is that how do you feel about is it? that I'm one uh, swastika away from like white supremacist. Oh, like, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts, man. I hate the way it looks. And like it's just amazing how much, you know, one haircut can do for your for your kind of self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that's your the interpretation of your own haircut. <laughs> that's the best part. It's like, you know, and, and anyone who knows me knows that I'm like totally not that. And um it's yeah, it's just one of those things where I'm like, I look in the mirror, I'm like, who are you? <laughs> that's pretty funny see i figured you just cut it so short because it's summertime or whatever because i oh, i went that to the too. barber the other week and i was almost gonna do the same thing because i've walked around with like basically a one right all the time for yeah. a, for a, lo- a lot of years i think like three or four years straight that's what i would walk around at all the time but elise was the one that told me it's like you look scary when you do that just yeah don't do it <laughs> <laughs> and like the weird thing is like i've not seen the shape of my head in a very long time you know i always have like a little bit longer hair on top. Yeah. I've not seen the shape of my head in a very long time. I'm not very happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... Oh. <laughs> it's nothing like shaving your head to or buzzing your hair down to really oh. just bring out what's going on with your dome. <laughs> yeah. Not human factors related, but just a matter of like how you know, how like these small... Cha- it's, and to be fair, it's a very small change. My hair was probably like what? Like three inches longer than it is now. And... It's just that small change can make a huge difference for the way you perceive yourself. It's your self identity, and you feel lost in anything. So, anyway, if I say anything racist on the show tonight, that's that's probably because it's, his haircut it's my haircut. Not really. No, I'm not going to say anything racist, and absolutely not. But um, I can't help but like see that kind of asshole in the mirror when I look at myself. And it's that's awesome. crazy. Well, I can identify <laughs> with that because I cut my hair not too long ago, and I felt I didn't feel like I was a white supremacist, but I it definitely like chopped my self-esteem in half because i hated it so much did you get used to it uh yeah i just basically was like ah fuck it all right i will <laughs> say though i will say though like 
playing um, virtual reality games is a lot easier now without all that hair. So it's like that. There, there is a trade off. There, there's a trade off. There's a trade off, and it's a lot you know cooler. And we don't have AC in this room in the afternoon, and so it's uh you know my glasses are fogging up, but my head is cool. That's good. See. <laughs> It's a win. <laughs> it's a win. All right. Well, it's time for Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. It's going to be anything from automation, uh, transportation. Uh, what do we got else in there? Robotics. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. Blake, what do we got up first on the docket this week? All right. First, we got self-driving cars could rev- revolutionize people's lives. But by the end of the next decade, or perhaps even sooner, they could radically transform public transportation spaces and liberate us all from the many problems of mass car ownership. So they'll be also be much better behaved than human drivers. So robot drivers won't break the speed limit, jump the lights, or park where they shouldn't be parking. Uh, they won't drive under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and they'll never get tired or behave aggressively. So imagine what your own city or town would look like with driverless taxis everywhere instead of your own private cars. But even with this thought in mind, an ethical concern arises about autonomous vehicles as far as what do you do in emergency situations? So questions come up like, should a car save its passengers at the cost of injuring other people? Should it swerve to avoid someone in the road if this means hitting someone on the pavement? Things like this come up on and off. But engineers working on driverless cars tell us that the safest response in an emergency situation like this for autonomous cars is to stop the vehicle. So this will be even safer if nearby cars all have robot drivers. And robot drivers would be better behaved than human ones, reducing the number of emergencies on the road to begin with. So this in turn begs the question, should human driving end when autonomous vehicles enter roads in mass? Yes. Yeah, I'm kind of of the same opinion. And this this article does a really good job of kind of breaking it down like some of the more the higher level implications like it's it's better for the environment it's better for people in general in terms of them being more active and that kind of stuff but i mean i think just from a safety perspective alone right. that's enough to really push the envelope to go all right don't re- like have maybe a racetrack or something if people really want to hold on to their cars go drive there but yeah. other than that autonomous vehicles all day yeah or some yeah like yes yes what is the threshold? Did did the article mention the threshold? I didn't. I didn't see like you, you know, uh, X percent of vehicles on the road. That is the threshold for all cars should be autonomous. Um, you know, because like ten percent of cars on the road being autonomous is not going to do much. Absolutely, thirty percent, probably not. Is it fifty one percent? Maybe the like threshold that is that level for you know, basically setting uh, cars free. Like once you have 51% of the population, it is now dominated. The majority of the vehicles out there on the road are autonomous vehicles and they can talk to each other and they can communicate. Is that the point? Or is it earlier? Is it 30%? Because that's still enough of a difference to where, like, I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, this one really deals with more of the emergency side of things. So what should really happen? And it talk goes into a little bit about the trolley problem as well. So there's no good thresholding like you're talking about. But I think it's an important thing to think about now is because of being autonomous vehicles in lots of different senses. I mean, whether it's, you know, privately owned ones like having a Tesla that can eventually maybe drive autonomously or if we're talking about like, you know, replacing delivery systems with trucks and stuff like that with right. autonomous vehicles. I, I think you've got to think about what happens or what's the safety margin going to be by keeping humans driving on the road. Right. Let and me let me throw some thresholds at you, Blake. Do it. And you tell me yay or nay. Yay or nay. Nay. 75% autonomous vehicles. Oh, man. Yeah, we should have done it at like 51. Okay, 51%. Yeah, I want to say you start... I, it's hard because I I want to say that that's got to be a good cutoff point because we okay. should building up to that point by the fifty one percent you should have enough data to make a a better clarified judgment about do these really reduce the amount of accidents right. or do they not this is is it still the same or is it more so I I don't know I think by the fifty one percent you threshold you have a lot more information because I think that's ultimately right. what's going to stop people or or Congress or whoever from making the jump because it's people are going to want to continue to drive their cars, especially if you've like sunk a lot of money into buying a car, all that kind of stuff. What? Let me throw out another percentage. 49%. Yeah. I don't, I I think if it gets past 
fifty percent. I would say all right. Fifty percent. Okay. Yeah. What about forty eight percent? Yeah, you can still hold on to your car. Forty forty seven percent. Forty seven point seven. Forty seven point seven percent. Yeah, you still hold on to your car. Okay, so I, I think you and I are on the same page here with fifty. 50% or 51%, the majority of the vehicles on the road are autonomous. However, I think it's useful to sort of um, think about all the data that's being collected by like a 30% on the road, right? Think about all 30% of all vehicles on the road are controlled autonomously. No human intervention. Not talking like Tesla where they have autonomous features but can still be picked up by humans. Talking fully autonomous vehicles, point A to point B, uh, completely automated. Um, that I still feel like is is a questionable percentage of like it's it's a minority, but it's a uh, it's a large minority of of vehicles on the road that are one like you mentioned in this article are communicating with each other. They are communicating with others um, to prevent or to prevent loss of life and, and to increase safety across them. And I feel like the, the threshold necessarily doesn't belong to where, how many quantity of vehicles on the road. I feel like it's almost like a, um, at what percentage, uh, is diminishing returns for, um, accidents and safety, you know, like, if we have 30% of the ve- 30% oh what am i trying to say so if we have like like 70% of the vehicles on the road reduces accidents by 98% or something then i i don't know what i'm trying to say i'm getting lost in thought here but basically what i'm trying to say is is the v- number of vehicles on the road the metric that we should be looking at here is there something else like any one of these other ones that you've um, mentioned here? I think it's, it's, it's funny cause it's definitely like all things, a multivariate problem, especially when we're talking about autonomous vehicles. Cause something that's, it's not talked about in this article. And I don't know if you've really broached it too many times on the show or not, but what, what do you start thinking about when, cause a lot of this article's like pie in the sky idea is when it, kind of starts is that we're going to remove kind of people having to use their cars at all. Well, what if like public transportation systems and kind of delivery systems and that stuff, that's what really starts off with autonomous vehicles being kind of in mass on the road. People still have their own cars. Maybe they have their own autonomous car or they have a Tesla where you're able to kind of jump in and interact with the automation. But I'm assuming something like that's a public transportation vehicle or even like we'll talk about with like drones that have some, some, some automation built into them that you're still going to have probably people that are employed to be supervisors over these things. So what's the, what's going to be the difference in terms of how safe something is if it's an autonomous vehicle that's got a supervisory control system versus an autonomous vehicle that's kind of got somebody that can maybe hop into the loop if they need to, but may not be kind of trained at it or know what they're looking for. So I think there's a couple of issues that come up with how these are released. Like, if, even if you take away everybody's private cars, does that mean that people own autonomous vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, or are they getting in like a rideshare service that grabs a bunch of people on the way to work that's ultimately surveilled or watched by some human operator if something starts to go wrong system wise or whatever? Hmm. I'm almost thinking like. So I'm thinking politically here, like, what would it take to convince, well, the public, really, that 100% automation is necessary? And I think part of that is when you can demonstrate that autonomous vehicles are safer than human drivers, a.k.a. the only accidents we're seeing are human driver caused and not automation driven. Um. I think that will go a long way for convincing the public that yes, we need 100% automation. However, like how you enforce that and how you ban drivers and what kind of rollout plan that just seems so intimidating to me that we need somebody smarter than I am to tackle that problem. Yeah, because it's it's almost like you have to like just for the case of somebody who is either like me or that has bought their first car or something or is leasing a car. 
All right, you, that's like sunk money into something that you can't have anymore. So that almost requires, may not require, but the best way to go about that may be like some kind of car buyback program. Something. So it's going to have to not just be about like, okay, we're replacing all the cars on the road with autonomous vehicles. There's got to be kind of an, a multitude of incentives of why we're kind of moving to the system and it'll take like different policy changes and stuff like that. I mean, because this right. has wider implications for just like transportation and you and me driving. Well, all right, if we do autonomous vehicles, what do cops do? What are firefighters doing? How does that impact yeah. them? Um, and what their job looks like if they're actually not operating any vehicles, um, which for police, it, it, it kind of turns it more into the surveillance thing, right? Because now you have like smart cities or we've talked about on the show, like the idea of smart cities and drones right. and stuff like that. Um, but like firefighting, for instance, I mean, it'll be a while before we get to the point where the robots we talked about last week can actually take over for the entire job of somebody. But I think there's some more implications to be thought of for emergency services, not necessarily just emergencies. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really great, great point there that maybe not, not necessarily what do we do with those roles, but the, the absolute need for 100% autonomy is illustrated by those because you can prioritize emergency services uh, in cases where, like, let's say traffic is really bad. Well, you part the Red Sea and the emergency vehicles can go right through. Absolutely. At top speed because they know everything's connected. They know what's coming up. They know everything. And so they can transport the emergency service vehicles to where they need to go. And you don't have any situations where, like, you're waiting on a stoplight or, you know, people are backed up at a stoplight and they can't really get through without going over the center divide or whatever. All the cars just part. Yeah. And that could like, there's one thing that I've, I've seen, I've only seen in California. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen other, in other places, but it always, it terrifies me for the police officer who's doing it. But like the highway patrol cars here that'll like, I, I'm not sure really what the purpose is. I'm assuming it's to corral traffic in some way. But they'll basically get ahead of traffic and start making an S pattern to yeah. slow it down. Yes. Like being able to eliminate those kind of tasks that potentially put somebody in danger that's just trying to do their job in the best way they can. I mean, that's that's again like another reason to go with your being able to part the seas model, right? You've got control over all the cars that are out there. Um, then it's just a, another way to, you know, get around anybody else having to put their life in danger. Uh, I think the, the one thing that this article, this article is quite good. It's just, it's very pie in the sky when it comes to autonomous vehicles about the things that are going to be eliminated and stuff like that. But I do worry sometimes about the amount of, you know, we're relying on such really, a <laughs> really good implementation of like a software infrastructure for this. And it just may, I don't know if it's like the work that I've done in the past or sometimes like to think about the more cynical side of things, but this just screams like cyber awareness problem all over the place. Oh yeah. This is a massive infrastructure that if hacked could destroy the United States or any country that has 100% autonomous vehicles. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or it even gets into like these sci-fi crime shows that I've seen where it's like you, you're taking over somebody's vehicle and that's like Slam how it you into murder a wall. somebody or whatever. Yep. Yeah. So the, there is a, there is still some kind of scary implications of going fully autonomous. Uh, but I think, I'll, I think it, like everything comes with trade-offs. Yeah. Uh, spe <laughs> speaking of which, did you see the cyberpunk trailer? No. Okay. We've talked about that on infinite. Uh, <laughs> Keanu Reeves. Anyway. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. That's fantastic. <laughs> so good. All right. What do we have up next? All right. So last week, Amazon showed off its new, newest fully electric delivery drone at its Mars conference in Las Vegas last week. So chances are it looks neither nor, looks neither nor flies like what you'd expect it to from a drone. So it's has a hexagonal des hybrid design and has very few moving parts using the shroud that protects its blades as it as its wings when it transitions from vertical to helicopter like flight at takeoff uh, similar to an airplane like mode what may be even more important though is that the drone is chock full of sensors and a suite of compute modules that run a variety of machine learning models to keep the drone safe so last week's announcement marks the first time that 
Amazon is publicly talking about those visual, thermal, and ultrasonic sensors, which are designed in-house, and how the drone's autonomous flight systems maneuver to land to its landing spot. So the focus here was on building a drone that is safe as possible and able to be independently safe. So even when it's not connected to the network and encounters a new situation, the drone will be able to react appropriately and safely. So according to Amazon, like all times we've heard about this, these drones will start making deliveries in the coming months, although it's not exactly clear what that time frame looks like. So Nick, this design of this drone, I, I when I saw the image of it, I was like, I, we've got to talk about this to some degree, right? Because it, I think yes. it starts to skirt some of the problems that I was thinking about in terms of like, how is this thing gonna, you know, protect itself when it's going around and flying and dropping things off in aerospace that people can potentially get into or like be grabbing things from? And it, I think some of the design features and the hexagonal shape around it kind of solve some of the problems. Yeah. So the hexagon kind of acts as a barrier from you know being able to have the blades hit anybody uh, if they were to just approach it from the side, uh, which, you know, in vertical takeoff and landing, that's what it would be doing. Um, and so presumably, if anything came at it from a horizontal direction, that would be protected. However, there's the um, vertical protection that's not taken into account, and hopefully you'd be able to detect a drone that's about to land on your head, or it would be able to detect you and alter its trajectory. Um this is interesting because if you think about the evolution of this design, so this looks very different from that kind of uh, wing drone um, look that we've seen before, right? It, ha- it used to have like kind of these three tail wings. I don't even know what they're called. Um, it's kind of like a miniaturized seaplane, is what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, kind of like that, and it's got like the the capability to grab a large package from um, below, and uh, that's gonna get that. You're what gonna, you got there? Yep. You're going to take that and <laughs> grab a large package. <laughs> uh, and uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by that. Then, uh, so, yeah, so I, I'm just curious in, in the, like, remodel or redesign of this technology here, I the one thing I'm not getting is how does it pick up boxes? Yeah, what are they attaching the boxes to? Because they don't actually, as far as the things that I've seen, they don't actually show it traveling with anything right i'm assuming that there's got to be at least footage out of there they really are focusing on kind of the vertical takeoff and landing and its capability to do that it seems like and transition and transition to flight right you have all this propulsion that now is being sent backwards instead of upwards and it can transition into that kind of uh horizontal flying drone that still has some downward propulsion but also has more propulsion in the back, meaning it gets to its destination quicker um, and probably has more stability when you think about this design. So that's good. Oh, whoa. Okay. I, I'm not sure if this is a model or not, but this thing's pretty huge. It's large. Yeah. It's I very mean, large. St- and, and some of the images that are shown from the conference, I mean, there's a guy that's standing next to it and it is definitely much wider than he is and probably about his height. Uh, so this is a pretty big, big, device that's flying around that's not what i expected for some reason i expected like little baby drones coming to your front door Mm, yeah i i don't know it'd be uh i don't know like any of these i'm i'm always interested to see it in practice and you know as soon as i see it kind of pick up a box from the distribution center and the main thing i'm interested in is how do humans interact with this right it is is it expected that amazon workers will place a box in front of it and it will pick it up, or do they have to load it in some certain way? And how do the workers do that in a way that makes that ensures that you know the box won't fall mid-flight? That also ensures that the um, box is easily removable once at the destination. Um, how do how are worker safety ensured? You know that kind of thing. How how do workers interact with these things? Because <clears throat> I think it was Amazon. We've seen technology where uh, they are improving the warehouse for autonomous robots in the in the warehouse interacting with humans on the warehouse floor. Yeah. And I'm just kind of curious in that technology what's going on here. Um, but they don't detail any of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering again, because I, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but recently we've talked about DHL kind of coming up with a different type of system for this, right? Where they've got basically pods or pillars.
pickup stations. Yeah, and if you missed that conversation, listeners, yeah, you're not alone. That's the conversation that got cut off by the wonderful oh, DHL bummer. music. All right, so the <laughs> DHL music cut us off about that. So, But I'm wondering yeah. if that's going to be part of the concept that they put out for these kind of drones. Because I still don't think that they've clarified whether they're, these things are going to be flying to your house, they're going to fly to some kind of drop-off station. Um, and And kind of the way this thing is built, I mean, I can't, I'm really not sure of the size dimensions, but it looks as if you might be able to put things inside of it. I'm not really sure. Uh, but if you were, I would assume that would either lend itself to people having to take stuff out, um, which do you do you really want this thing showing up at your door and you have to pick the right one? I'm not really sure. Uh, so I feel like there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think the design of the aircraft or the drone itself is pretty sensible and it solves some of the problems. Uh, but in terms of how this, how it gets implemented in the real world, that should be interesting to see. So a couple things uh, from Amazon's blog here that I want to point out. Um, they do mention that they have AI algorithms trained to detect people and animals from above. Thank goodness. They also mention that customers' yards may have clotheslines, telephone wires, electrical wires, etc. And wire detection is one of the hardest challenges for low altitude flights. Um, and they've invented these computer technician or computer vision techniques uh, to recognize and avoid these wires. Um, but th- this is interesting because this is not something that I even thought of, and that's might just be because I'm currently living in an apartment. But this will be able to drop off packages in people's backyards to ensure safety, right? Like that's more safe than a front porch. Oh yeah, because then you don't have to worry about people snagging stuff off your porch. Or Am I just dumb, or is that like something that? I just didn't think of or I feel dumb because that's like one of the biggest sort of uh, benefits to this is being able to just drop it off in the backyard. Yeah, that's true. Does Unless it have, you got a dog back there that's going to tear the package up. Or does it have pool detection? Up. Like that would yeah, be. Yeah, avoid the pool. Ugh. Uh, yeah. So. Or does I, it change the height based off what's in the package? Like if it was because Amazon's dabbling in the food industry now or right. delivering groceries, does it get a little bit lower if it's got to drop some eggs? Yeah. Ah, who knows? A lot of unanswered questions. That's for, that's for sure. And the only thing that, that I just thought of, but I think this thing is way too big, because you said the backyard thing and living in an apartment. Like, what if this could drop stuff off on my porch? Yeah, because that, that's secured and it's up in the air and you couldn't get to it unless you go in the apartment. Right. Um, so, that's yeah, it. like, how, can you drop a pin and say, like, this is my preferred drop-off location? Um, and then give it feedback and say like, "Hey, you dropped it on my roof last time. Uh, can you not? I can't do that get again? it. Can you go pick it up? <laughs> can, can you not do that again? Thanks, bro. Um, and I'm sure it will learn uh, to the point where it's like delivering it exactly to the place where you want, and it's on this pre-programmed path. Uh, yeah, lots to look forward to. It's gonna be sick. Yes. Well, we're gonna be back to break down the other news stories right after this short break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Yes, our Patreon program. Program. Uh, Join us tonight. We are taking a quick, short detour away from our coverage of the American Space Program. Um, Program. We are taking a short detour to talk about some things that have been piling up, namely Google Stadia. Um, What else we got on the docket? Got Galaxy's Edge. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk a lot of it about that. Yeah. Why Foster's is the preferred human factors beverage. Yeah. Foster's Australian for human factors. Uh, yeah, We got a lot of stuff to talk about Absolutely. on Infinite. So please join us over there if you can. 
Uh, and then next week we'll get back to our American space program. What's up next in the American space program? Do you know? Oh, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I want to say some other odd, awesome documentary on space. Yes, yeah, this actually like may that. be our first documentary on space, right? Yes, I think we're in the, the docs now. Nice. Yes, I'm, I'm excited so for this. It'll, it'll be fun. Uh, but before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at biz.org, TechCrunch, iTrip, and IEEE Spectrum for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us on social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. Uh, a lot of great discussion comes out of that Slack. We comment right on those things, uh, go back and forth. So it's a lot of fun. You should join us. All right, Blake, we got one more news story up this week. What's going on with Jacko? All right. So Jacko, robots of all kinds can enhance human capabilities, especially for people with disabilities. So Canova Robotics... Robotics Jacko arm is an assistive robotic arm designed to be mounted on an electronic wheelchair. So with six degrees of freedom plus a three-fingered gripper, the lightweight carbon fiber arm is frequently used in research because it's rugged and versatile. So Jacko is designed to move move at a safe speed and make direct contact with the end user and draw very little power directly from the wheelchair. So the most important consideration in the design process of an assistive robot is the safety of the end user. So Jocko users operate their robots through their existing drive controls to assist them in daily activities such as eating, drinking, opening doors, and they don't have to worry about the robot arm draving, draining their chair's batteries throughout the day. Nick, this is pretty amazing to see because it's, it's basically an extension of yourself on a wheelchair. So, like, like one of the things about, and we talked about this before, is is um, the need for accessibility, and because a lot of people who are um, disabled are unable to perform the tasks that maybe they were able to do before or could never do, um, and so being able to provide those individuals with a way to interact with the world um, or give them back a way to interact with the world that they previously had, in this case, you know, being able to grab objects and like have that range uh is is huge it's huge for accessibility and this uh this is really cool because they're basically promising this at low power that just hooks onto your wheelchair and it's it's a third arm that you can control with your wheelchair controls taps into the battery uses not a whole lot of electricity so normal use can just happen without having to worry about recharging your battery or anything which is pretty amazing because that was the one thing I was wondering when it started mentioning that it's actually going to just be connected to the wheelchair and take from the power source. It was like, oh, man, is this going to just destroy the battery or right. you're going to have to have some kind of augmented pack to keep you going throughout the day. But it, it seems like they've already thought through a lot of kind of those power issues. But, I mean, just the fact that you're able to – and it's cool that this is being used a lot in research purposes because maybe the design or over time will, of course, grow – but the fact right. that it's kind of rugged and versatile, you don't really have to worry about, like, if you make the wrong move, you're not going to break it right. or anything it's like that. It's not fragile. It's, yeah. yeah. And the it's it's probably great that it has so many de- – because I think it said it had six degrees of freedom. So six, yeah. hopefully at home, you're not too worried about, like, knocking your dishes over or, so- or doing something and breaking something in the house. Uh, yeah, that still could happen. But with that three-fingered gripper – you know that's that's not going to happen. Yeah, so that you got a little little bit more dexterity than without it, right? So I don't know. Yeah. It's it's awesome to see that it's being tested. So you've got some additional points here, Nick. Yeah, I do. I want to bring up this. So they they have this use case here to kind of illustrate the point, and I I think that it's important to hear the stories behind these news stories that we talk about every week. Uh, so we do bring these to you when we can because it kind of really nails home the application of this, and that's really. As human factors people, that's really what we want to get at. So here's an example of 11-year-old Mary Nelson who uses the robot arm to work with a horse. So Mary uses a headset microphone to amplify her voice, and she will use the arm and finger to adjust the microphone in front of her mouth after she's done eating. Um, Additionally, Mary will use the arms to reach down and adjust her feet or leg by grabbing them with the arm and moving them to a more comfortable position. All of these are examples that she's never really asked us to do, but something she needed and just didn't did on her own with the help of the arm. So this is one uh, taking out some of that, um, like the the dignity piece. It's restoring some dignity because you don't have to ask for like the simple things or what you know um, might be considered simple tasks, right? Just moving your legs or repositioning a microphone on your head. Um, those are very simple things and. 
to be able to do that, to be empowered to do that yourself instead of asking somebody else to do that for you is huge. Absolutely. And th- the fact that uh, I think my favorite part of all these stories are the ones that we hear about that are from the re- research perspective is that when they design these tools, they have so many unintended, unintended consequences in the positive, in the positive way. Right. So the, them mentioning at the end here that there's a lot of things she was able she needed to do but they really hadn't thought about it doing it with the arm and i right. mean the ability to you know be brushing a horse or something like that or doing horse care with when you're in a wheelchair and you don't have access to your own limbs and now you've got this extra external arm that's allowing you to do something that maybe maybe you loved when you were younger and some accident right. happened and you couldn't do it anymore or it's just you've never interacted with a horse before and now this allows you to have some sort of semblance of what maybe you and I would be having so i don't know it's just incredible that this kind of technology it's it, with its unintended consequences allowing people just to connect with the world a little bit more like okay think it, many listeners have pets i just want to take a minute here like Imagine you get into an accident or something. This is hypothetical. I don't wish this on you, but like, just think about this. You get into an accident, and your best friend, your animal, whatever, cat, dog, pig, horse, whatever it is, you're sitting there, and like for me, it would be my cats, right? Like my cats come up to me. I can't move except for maybe my arm, and maybe I can't. I don't even have that much dexterity with it. They come up to me. They want pets. I can't give them pets. And it breaks my heart because I just want to interact with them. Something like this would allow me to do that. While I wouldn't be able to feel their little fur on my fingers, I'd still be able to, you know, pet them and, and you know, give them the scritches, the head scritches. That's true. And, like, that, I don't know, man. Like, just looking through this example, this is, like, I don't know. It, it'd be huge, I think. I do want to say, though, that they also mentioned... Um, expertise a little bit here they say that the difference between a new user and an experienced user could be as little as two weeks so that learning curve is really really tiny like if you think about just two weeks you're kind of an experienced master user with this thing that training time is nothing if you consider that with other things oh yeah i mean a lot of this ramp up for anything like this like learning how to use any kind of robotic mode or robotic arm or even because we've talked about like factory applications of robotic arms that have taken a lot longer in terms of how long it takes to be experts at using them or interacting with them. Right. Or even last week when we talked about like the tele robotics story. Yeah. I mean, that had a larger ramp up time than only yeah. two weeks. Yeah. And I mean, so like the reason they say this is, is because it's just adding a new mode to their chair. So they have like drive mode and then they have uh robot mode and they basically just use robot mode with the same controls that they're already using. So they kind of, uh, th- which speaks volumes about the sort of um, human factors going on here is if, if they're able to map that so well to those controls that they're already using, like that that speaks a lot about the, the controls that scheme that they're using with this technology. Well, it's, it sounds like they obviously did their homework before deciding, before like really trying to implement whatever robotic arm they designed, right? Because I mean, part of, what you and I experience a lot of in our work is like the integration and current systems. And what do you, right. how do you do that? What does that mean? How do you bring things together? Um, and this is a perfect example of that for assistive technology, taking the fact that, okay, we've already got some kind of drive system and something that people are already used to interacting with. And how can we map what's already there into this robotic arm or whatever it may be? Yeah. So it's pretty sick. Yeah. It'd be like, uh, mapping human control, like if you couldn't control your body and you had an exosuit, you know, and, and you just mapped it to video game controls for someone like you and I, you know, yeah. like we, we know how to use a controller. We can just keep the controller in our hand and just do those, perform those actions. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, one other point here before we move on. Um, they do mention, you know, assi- for assistive robots, implementation of greater autonomy involves a focus on end user safety and improvements with the robot's awareness of its environment. Um, And they go on to mention that when autonomous robots work in close proximity with humans, they need vision. And this is in order to avoid haptic or collisions and haptic haptic feedback gives the user um, or gives the robot really uh, awareness of how much force is being exerted on these objects. And, um, you know, all these technologies exist or it's just the, the, obstacle of bringing them all into this assistive technology market um 
basically funding and medical necessity. That's what it comes down to. Uh, and we just need to show it with examples like this. It looks like they're doing they're doing some awesome work. And thanks, I triple A for throwing this yeah, one together. They or throwing are it up. doing some awesome work with that one. It came from. It came from. All right, we're switching gears here. We're getting to it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit, anything is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. It's been a while since we visited Reddit because. Over the last couple of weeks, we've gotten uh, emails from some of our listeners. And uh, I do want to say again, thank you to all of our listeners who wrote in. If you want to be one of the listeners that writes in, please write in to show at humanfactorscast.com. We, we love... Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. I have, I have a sound bite for that one. Just do it. There oh, you that's go. Awesome, all right. Yeah. So a long time since I've know, heard that one. I know. It's been a minute. All right. So yeah, just write in and uh, we'll read it on the show. In fact... Uh, we do have a follow-up from AK last week. You remember we we mentioned the twenty 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 rule, and we also mentioned the ten 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 rule. Ten ten ten. And um, it, it, sorry, we mentioned the ten 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 rule on the show. What episode twenty something? But don't do the ten ten ten. Do the twenty twenty twenty. And AK, <laughs> <laughs> You're just saying numbers. I'm just saying numbers. <laughs> got the thirty. Got the twenty. Got the fifty. Ninety. Twenty seven. Forty three. Okay. So I, I do want to get to this, though. So AK actually did a follow-up here on the 2020-20. Um, they actually add, they recommend adding an additional 20. Um, he goes on to write, they, they say, Many people feel that a slightly improved version of the rule would be to look at an object 20 feet away every 20 minutes and blink 20 times. <clears throat> this not only keeps one busy for 20 seconds, it helps to keep the surface of the eyes wet. And this is especially helpful because reduced blinking while working at a computer causes drying of the eyes, which leads to eye irritation. So there you go. Instead of 20 seconds, just blink 20 times, and that should take care of both of them. I like it. All right. I'm going to do that from now on. So let's just stare into the camera and blink a couple times while we are... um, Yes, this is... Oh, this this is is an exercise. This this is an exercise. Wow. All right. So while Blake keeps blinking and I'm going to try to blink, I'm going to go actually into this first Reddit here. 20 times Um, is too much. It's Actually, hard. Blake, do we have time for one or two? We got time for two of them, so we'll just do both of them. All right, so we got, okay, this first one here is from the user experience subreddit, um, and it's just a topic. So on the topic of Apple UX, uh, I don't really understand the philosophy behind making features hard to find. Is it a trade off between less cluttered UI and obvious functionality? Any thoughts? This is from user StevRev59, again, on the user experience subreddit. So, StevRev, uh, again, this trade off between less cluttered UI, uh, functionality, and behind the scenes features. Blake, you're an Apple user. I am. So, what's going on? I really I like the way that they brought this up because it's, it's often something that I don't really can consider to be the case with apple and maybe it is it's not something i've really thought about which is a bit shameful because they they bring up the fact that it's a trade-off of clutter like if you have too many too many apps or icons or things like that like maybe it just makes the interface look bad maybe they're just not features that everybody's going to use but there and I'm, i was looking for some before we started but there are even some on newer iPhones, not necessarily mine, there are some like interaction modes in terms of like how you hold the phone or how you open it that will, you know, give you different features. Wait, and so you're it, saying that when you open the phone differently, it will give you there's, something different? There's something weird that I was looking for and can't quite find. But I, I don't know that it's necessarily always a trade off between functionality and the UI being easily presentable. I think sometimes. I think sometimes developers like to bake things in there that they think are interesting or sandbox ideas they like to use. Um, now, so, some of the features I don't understand the hiding of at all. And I, I don't know if Android has anything analogous like this, but in, like, for Probably. instance, in, like, global settings inside of Apple, you get to the global settings panel, but you, if unless you've done this before or whatever, there's actually a way to just search global settings from that menu, but you have to scroll down and scroll back up. Mm. And it, then it shows you that's where the search bar is. And I don't, I don't see the point of that or why that's even there. Um, can I, can I just mention, by the way, that one of the greatest inventions in the Android settings, at least, is the ability to search the settings. Yeah, it's the best. It, it is the best. I'm looking for developer options and I search developer and there it is. Boom. 
Um, yeah, because it stops you having to dive down into the menu structure or anything like that, or at least that's from my perspective. Because there's, there's always stuff that I'm doing, like turning on low power mode and whatnot. Now, a lot of that has been kind of nicks for me ever interacting with the UI because I'll just do voice commands. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true, too. Like, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not super familiar with Apple UX. I, I do know that their kind of mantra is simplicity is key. Um, you know, they, it's, it's like the difference between buying... Um, I've used this analogy before, but it's like, uh, buying a Ferrari with the hood welded shut versus buying a uh, Honda Civic with where you can go in and kind of tweak everything. Um, and that's kind of the analogy I use. And like, so Apple is a Ferrari, but you can't modify it. You can't tweak it. You can't do the things you want with it. So you have to go outside the means and jailbreak it or something like that right. if you really want to tweak a lot right. of what's you, going on with it, the OS. Yeah, you got to get like a like some sort of... Um, saw to get into the hood or what i don't know i'm yeah. bad with tools but you get my point you get my analogy there i think uh yeah so I'm, I'm unfamiliar with it but i was just curious what you thought yeah i think some of it's kind of fun because a lot of people like to play in product design at least with discoverability so they like people interacting with the phone or interacting with the software and you find things over time it's, right it's, it plays into that idea that in ux more so than even factors of like interactions being delightful right right so, like, you found something new, it should, like, give you a sense of, like, oh, this is really cool, or I'm enjoying this. So, that could be a reason they hide some of the, like, some of the features, but I'm not really sure what the process or thinking is. If you know somebody at Apple, let us know. We'd love yeah. to talk. Yeah, Apple, if you're listening. Um, Blake, you mentioned delightful interactions. Uh, you know what I find to be a delightful interaction? I have no idea. I'm every, scared. Every Monday night. Oh, that's about- just... Does anybody else want to throw up? <laughs> No, it, right. it is a delightful interaction. Uh, we do have one more here. Um, and oh, this is going to be a spicy one. Uh, this one's a little long, so I'm going to try to truncate the best I can. This one's by user better than 2018. Um, and this one's also from the user experience subreddit. And um, this one here is how to bring up UX with others. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit here and actually read this here. Uh I took it, I'm just going to, again, this is picking up right in the middle of it. I took it upon myself to create a group club in the community based on UX and UI. Not many are joining, probably because they don't know what it is and prefer to join groups directly related to their boot camp of choice, but I want to become an advocate for good UX practices whenever someone were to ask me for advice. Some UX evangelism that I've seen in boot camp hosted seminars makes me wonder if there's a right or wrong way to go about talking about UX to potential boot camp developers I wouldn't want to give anyone unsolicited advice, but if someone were to ask me for help, I don't want to steer them wrong. I know the stub has this sub, meaning a user experience subreddit, uh, has a bit of cynicism towards boot camps, but going forward, both in this community and elsewhere, what are some good practices for introducing UX beginner developers and others who want to learn about it? Is there a right way to talk about UX and good practices? Does it come off as too preachy? Uh, should I not talk about it until they're done with the bulk of boot camp work? Are there other things I don't know about talking about UX to others that I should know? Sorry if it sounds like I'm overthinking things or I'm just ignorant, but I wanted to know your thoughts. So I don't think you are overly thinking things or ignorant. Um, I think these are good questions. And I'm, I'm almost thinking about these in terms of, you know, you have developers and you want to educate them on the importance and uh, sort of what UX is and how to not necessarily how to do it because that's your job, but um, sort of how how to inform them, you know? Absolutely, yeah. yes. This is, this is a little bit tougher of a situation in my head, and let me know if, if you have a different perception of the question, but I'm, it, and again, this could just be me being a little bit confused. It's one of those times where I wish I could reach out directly to the user and ask a little bit more because this is specifically seems like it's focusing on people that are in develop like full stack development boot camps cuz it keeps it keeps bringing up yeah. boot camp over and over and the fact that like how do i really introduce them to ux um which makes me wonder like what's the situation because it's a li- it's a little bit easier or different when you're talking about like if you guys are working together on a product um for a company or for like some specific cause I mean, there, there's easier ways to kind of find yes. the common ground. Like you're, you guys are trying to build something. You, you've interacted with users. You've either launched something and found something's really wrong with the, with the product yeah, that's been hey, developed. Hey, look at this data. 
Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you can be the scientist. Here, it's a little bit more difficult. The one thing that um, I'm a little bit surprised about, I guess, and maybe not so much if you're trying to do full stack, but I feel like a lot of development boot camp programs that I've looked into or like even online courses that I've taken, they do like focus a good bit on principles behind user experience design or like even like what's it's good to have you know consistency in your design and stuff like that so at least at a high level sometimes that this stuff is even covered in coursework um i think worrying about being too preachy i can totally understand that because this and again this gets at the context of where this is happening because this is just something that you're kind of trying to talk to uh, your friends of yours that are like in a full stack development group Maybe it's not something they're super concerned with because full stack development deals with both front and back end. And sometimes right. back end can be so daunting trying to figure out and learn anything else is very difficult to wrap your head around. Yeah. And if they're not super worried about what's going on on the front end, it's going to be harder to break through and really make them understand or care about it. Which in the context of working at a place where you can help like create design culture and like have impact on something you guys are working on together it's a little bit easier to kind of bring in like what is UX, what is human factors, what does a heuristic analysis look like? Why do we talk to users? The right, importance right. of it. Um, so I hear the context is a little bit unclear to me or why it's kind of happening this way, but I, I don't know, Nick, what's your perspective? Uh, I think it's something along those same lines. I'm, I'm reading over the whole question again and think that's something that they're trying to get at again, lacking the context. Um, but what are some good practices for introducing UX to beginner devs and others who want to learn about it? Um, there are the go-to uh, sort of human factors or um, UX books that you can point them to, right? I mean, like, it depends on what kind of learner they are. If they're self-motivated, then give them, you know, design of everyday things. I think that's a pretty good entry-level book, especially for non-human factors people. It just kind of gives you the... Um, the perspective for how to design things and, and purposeful uh, intent behind the design that will inform, you know, the, the, the shape or the manifestation of those designs in the physical environment. You know, like, I think that is one good way to kind of show the intent. Um, as for the right way to talk about UX and good practices, um, it's it's always that fine line of, don't be too preachy, but at the same time, you got to evangelize. Like, don't go door to door and ask, have you heard about our Lord and Savior, Don Norman? Um, but also, you know, don't <laughs> don't completely say, yeah, you just develop what you want and I'll fix it later. You know, there, there has to be some sort of um, some sort of interaction there. Yeah, I think I think the best thing you can do here is. And again, it's trying to figure out like the best way to insert yourself in the context. But I mean, if you're a practicing UX designer, human factors engineer, whatever it may be, if you have like prior work that illustrates the impact that you've had through like applying these principles or ROI. Yeah, that's the biggest way to make anybody change their mind or really understand. And also too, like trying to better understand from a developer perspective, like why is it so hard for me to make changes and understanding the frameworks they're working in and their kind of plight, I think being able to find that that common ground with a developer and a UX person is really key to any kind of like accepting of, you know, new ideas or why we do things the way we do them. Because if you both understand where you're coming from, you have a lot more susceptibility to trying to figure out and problem solve together versus just like, all right, your the product you develop doesn't meet our users' needs. We really need to fix it and I know how versus like, okay, we launched this thing. We've been working on it together. looks like we need to make some changes. Here's how we can do it. Um, so I don't know. I'd, I'd be more, try to be as, as collaborative as possible. I agree. No better place to end than there. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of the news stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, please stay tuned for the after show. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media at H Factors Podcast. Join cam. Yeah. If, if you want to, uh, wait, what? Dot cam. <laughs> Dot com. If you want to send us an email, like AK did, you can email us at show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. There it is. I want to, th I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf 
for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about dropping packages? If you want to drop a package, you can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing each and every week. Uh, thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. I'm Nick Rome. You can find me at uh, social media at Nick underscore Rome. There you go. Uh, until next time, it, it depends. depends.